Good afternoon. Welcome to the New America Foundation. I'm Peter Berger. I run this secure, national security program here. Uh, we're, we've got an absolutely stellar lineup to discuss the, the art of effective and efficacious interrogation. Uh, on, my, on your right, far right, Mark Fallon, who uh, the director of the wonderfully named Club Fed, uh, who has had a distinguished career uh, in, in many, uh, involved in many cases, the USS Cold case, the Sheikh, uh, the Sheikh Omar Abdul Rahman case, the Blind Sheikh case. He was also the Deputy Commander of Special Agent in Charge of the Department of Defense of the Criminal Investigation Task Force, responsible for the investigation of terrorists uh, who might go uh, before the military commissions at Guantanamo. He's been forward deployed in Afghanistan, Iraq, and Guantanamo. Uh, next to him is uh, Colonel Steve Kleiman, uh, who is a retired officer, U.S. Air Force. Uh, he was the former head of the Air Force Strategic Interrogation Program. He's also been an instructor in the Air Force uh, uh, survival, evasion, resistance, and escape training, the SEER training that we're all familiar with. Uh, he also served as a senior advisor to the Intelligence Science Board in that 374-page study, Educing Information, which is sort of the gold standard on this issue. Uh, Dr. Christian Meisner, next to uh, Colonel Kleinman, is a professor of psychology at Iowa State. He holds a PhD in cognitive and behavioral science, um, and he has uh, published uh, widely and been funded by the National Science Foundation, National Academy of Sciences, uh, and many other places. And then uh, finally, Dr. Melissa Rusano is a professor of criminal justice at Roger Williams University. She's got a PhD in legal psychology. And so each of the our distinguished panelists is going to talk for about 10 minutes or so and give some opening remarks, and then we'll have a uh, discussion with the audience. So let's start with you, Mark. Well, thank you, Peter. Thank you for the introduction, and uh, thanks uh, to New America for having us, and uh, honored to be here uh, with you and the, and the other panelists. And thank you, everyone, for, uh, for, for coming uh, today to, to hear what we have to say. Uh, really, what I want to talk about is kind of the profound uh, impact that September 11th had on all of us. Uh, and on that day, certainly our history changed, and it affect each of us differently. It affect our policies, uh, and it, it changed the course of history for us as a country and for many of us uh, as individuals. Um, following those attacks, there were a few critical decisions that uh, the country made to protect itself. Uh, the National Command Authority, the President, the Commander-in-Chief uh, made some decisions. Uh, Right in the aftermath, uh, based on fear, fear of future attacks, based on worries of second waves of attacks, uh, to try to protect us, our citizens, and our country. Uh, and there were a few kind of very interesting policy decisions that impacted certainly me at the time and, and some of us in the room. Uh, and that was on the, the 14th of September, uh, there was a presidential proclamation. And in that proclamation, uh, President Bush uh, actually stated that there's a state of national emergency and we're going to have to do things a little bit differently. And there were some cascading effects of that and some pres uh, presidential uh, decision directives and other things. And, and, and the results was the creation uh, of what's called the CIA RDI program, uh, Rendition, Detention, Interrogation Program. And, and the goal of that program was to give uh, the Central Intelligence Agency some authorities uh, and some responsibilities that, that weren't really a core competency, was, was not a core mission for the Central Intelligence Agency. And that was to, to render, uh, to set up detention operations and interrogation operations, which was something that, that, that they generally did not do uh, as a core skill. Um, also, less than a month later, just sh short of a month later, uh, on the 13th of November, 2001, another very impacting uh, order was issued. Uh, President Bush issued a military order uh, on that date that actually established that the Department of Defense would be responsible for the investigation of Al-Qaeda terrorist network for trials before military commission. Both very kind of historic decisions, uh, certainly in my lifetime, uh, because I had worked for years on those cases Peter mentioned with the FBI, uh, working cases that were going to be tried before the Department of Justice. So it was a very unique responsibility, uh, I thought, for the Department of Defense to get and for the CIA to get. Uh, and I was uh, honored to, to have been chosen to be the deputy commander of that task force and uh, with, with a team of 200 some odd people were investigating Al-Qaeda uh, for trials for military commission. Uh, history will judge whether either of those decisions were sound ones, uh, if they did in fact help protect our national security or, or maybe further jeopardize it. Uh, not, not here to talk about that today, but 
Uh, but, but certainly there were two kind of core issues that I think are germane to, to our discussions here today. Uh, the role psychologists played in the formulation of each of those uh, missions. Uh, psychologists played a major role in the creation of the CIA's RDI program. And psychologists played a major role uh, assisting and supporting the CITF when we designed our inter interrogation training programs. Uh, I would certainly argue that uh, one was for the better, one might be for the worst. Uh, but, but, but they were two, th that was one unique aspect. The other unique aspect uh, about it, which is germane again today, is uh, the role that research played or lack of research played mm -hmm. in the formulation of those policies and, and in the aftermath uh, of that. And that's the historic perspective. Fast forward now to six weeks ago or so on, on the 9th of December, uh, and a remarkable uh, event uh, occurred that day when Dianne Feinstein, uh, the chairman of the Senate Select Committee on Intelligence, uh, uh, stood on the Senate floor and, and basically released what has become known as the torture report. Uh, a, a remarkable document. Uh, 500 some odd pages. It's kind of a misnomer. It's actually the executive summary of a 6,000 page torture report. Uh, that was the result of the culmination of about five years of investigation uh, that looked at over 6 million pieces of documentary evidence uh, of what occurred that helped formulate those decisions, that helped create the course of history that was charted. Uh, based on those uh, uh, decision directives that, that were made. Uh, and and, and uh, I, I want to just read something that, uh, a quote from Senator Feinstein, because I, I think it really is uh, rather remarkable. Uh, Senator Feinstein said uh, on the floor of the Senate in that, on the 9th of December, specifically, the report provides examples where interrogators had sufficient information to confront detainees with facts and know when the detainees were lying, and where they applied rapport building techniques developed and honed by the US military, the FBI, and more recently the interagency high value detainee interrogation group called the HIG, that these techniques produced good intelligence. She went on to say that the CIA had not researched effective interrogation techniques or developed a legal basis for the use of interrogation techniques outside the rapport building techniques that were the official CIA policy until that time. And that's what a lot of people don't realize. The CIA's policy up until that time was only to use rapport-based interrogation techniques. And I know some people who interrogated uh, for the CIA who only used those. Uh, and, and so that's really why we're here today. That was that, that this HIG, this high value detainee interrogation group that was established uh, um, as a result of an executive order by President Obama uh, shortly after he took office, I believe the second day, uh, that actually established an interagency task force uh, t to look at how to best elicit accurate and reliable information to protect our national security, and, and did a few remarkable things there. Uh, one was, uh, it was kind of unique that they created a unique unit to actually do these interrogations. Uh, in, in my experience, if the HIG disappeared, there would be other people who actually could do those interrogations and, and probably do them very effectively. What was very, very unique about it is the fact that they created a capacity to do research, evidence-based research, in how best use science to help inform the operational community how to best conduct interrogations. Uh, and, and what is interesting is that it, it has been more than 50 years since the US government has sponsored any research to actually look at how, how to best interrogate someone. So for years, as a career federal law enforcement officer and counterintelligence uh, operator, uh, we have been training and using techniques that are based on a lot of great experience, but, but, but it has not been helped along or informed by science. And, and so that's what we're gonna uh, hopefully discuss a little bit today is, is what the science is actually telling us so that we're actually merging the art of interrogations with the science interrogations so that we can artfully apply the science within the operational community. So, so let me just go over a few things I want to make sure that I don't miss about, uh, about the research program. It's pretty interesting that the, the research program uh, is all unclassified. It's actually being conducted globally. Uh, broad agency announcements advertise and solicit people to come in, scientists to come in. 
Uh, and there is research that's been underway uh, for years in Australia, in the United Kingdom, in Sweden, in the United States. Uh, so for years, research scientists have been looking at how to best do our jobs uh, as operators and elicit accurate reliable information through lawful means. Uh, and, and, and so, so we have uh, with us uh, people who were both involved in the research uh, program doing research for my alma mater, Roger Williams. It's great to see uh, m m my former college involved in these things. And, and certainly Chris is the chief investigator and the chief scientist overseeing these programs. It's a remarkable opportunity to kind of hear uh, what they have to say. Uh, I've been rather amazed uh, that people are not clamoring for this information now. Uh, th the studies uh, are published in peer journals. Uh, just recently, I think around November, uh, the Journal of Applied Cognitive Psychology published a special edition actually publishing the results of these studies to the community. Uh, the HIG conducts an annual research symposium where research scientists from around the world, the foremost experts in the science of interrogation, uh, come here to D.C. and actually present their findings, and, and that's when uh, the, the idea to come here germinated. Peter was at our last one and, and was our key, keynote speaker at lunch, and we talked about how, how we needed to get this information out, so I'm grateful that, that he took that and, uh, and, and brought us here today. Uh, but, but, but there's a body of work, a body of science uh, that is going on, and actually we're starting to see now, which is very enc encouraging for me because I've also be been involved quite a bit in some training programs, is the fact that we're now seeing uh, federal law enforcement training programs actually merging some of the science uh, with the art inter of interrogation. And I hope we get to talk about uh, a little bit about that. Uh, I, I, ju I just want to uh, close with, with, with two things. If, if, you're, if, if you're in this business, I mean, if, if you're looking at how to elicit accurate reliable information, uh, I would suggest to you that, that what is known as the torture report, that 500-page booklet is a wealth of knowledge. It is a lesson learned historically about what went right, what went wrong, and why it went right, and why it went wrong, that anyone who's a national security professional ought to be reading. Uh, you know, if I was within NCIS still, I would make that mandatory reading for anyone working in my department. It is that, it is that critical to understand why we got to where we are today. Uh, and, and, I'll, and I'll just close. I've read, I've read the, the entire torture report word by word. I actually read it twice. I wanted to make sure I didn't, I didn't miss anything. And I just want to quote from a very powerful email uh, that I found uh, uh, in that torture report. Uh, and it, it's a 2005 email uh, from the CIA Inspector General to the CIA uh, Director, Porter Goss. And this is after he looked at kind of what was coming off the rails in the CIA with respect to interrogation. And, and what the IG said to the CIA Director was, we have found that the agency over the decades has continued to get itself in messes related to interrogation programs for one overriding reason. We do not document and learn from our experience. Each generation of new officers is left to improvise anew with problematic results for our officers as individuals and for our agency. Uh, so those of you here who represent agencies, you know, I would encourage you uh, to learn those lessons from that torture report, L learn from our mistakes so that we can improve our profession and so that we come, become better uh, interrogation professionals because I believe our national security depends upon it. Thank you, Mark, for that really excellent setup. Um, uh, Colonel Kleiman, or you, you want to go next? Okay, yeah, sorry. I'll, I'll go next. And okay. Um, thank you for, okay. for having us here. And, um, I'm honored to be here and a part of this panel. And, and what I'm going to do is talk to you a little bit about some of the earlier research in the HIG program. The HIG research program is in its fifth year now. And one of the first early efforts was to establish baseline knowledge to assess what we already knew, which, which leads off of what the quote Mark was just um, reading to you, which is this, this notion of there is expertise out there. There are people on the ground for years who've been conducting interrogations. So one of the earlier efforts, the aims of the HIG research program was to assess that systematically. So myself, uh, along with a number of people on the panel, other researchers started by doing interviews, structured interviews and surveys of interrogators with expertise. So 
highly experienced military, law enforcement, counterterrorism interrogators to find out what they thought works and doesn't work based on their, their knowledge and their experience. So in, my, in, in, in the study that I led, for example, we sat down with a group of about 42 interrogators and we asked them questions like, what types of techniques lead to eliciting reliable information? What's most effective and what's least effective? And, and what makes a good interrogator in the first place? So I'm going to walk you some of the highlights through that, and, um, and Chris will then take you through some of the, the more recent research that the Hague has been conducted. So in terms of what um, interrogators tell us, what makes a good interrogator? Are there certain characteristics? Obviously, this is an important issue, right? Because we have new interrogators that need to be trained, and, um, and the, the, the skills that they talk about the most are interpersonal skills. So having good oral communication skills, being able to make a connection with a person, and also being behaviorally adaptable and flexible. So this, um, this has also been looked at, this notion of a core interrogator competency model. Are there certain skills that interrogators need to have? Has been examined by others, funded by the Hague, Gonzalo Ferraro, for example. And that's something that comes up a lot as well, behavioral flexibility. An interrogator needs to be able to adapt to the particular interrogation and to the particular target that they're working to, as, as, as well as having those excellent interpersonal communication skills, being able to build trust with the person they're talking to. In terms of what interrogators, and these are, the, again, the ones with experience, and, and a, about half of our sample had high-value target experience, what, what do they say is most effective at eliciting reliable information? It's relationship and rapport building skills. Building a connection, understanding who they're talking to, developing mutual respect and trust, those are the things that they say elicit, ultimately will elicit reliable information from people. What do they say don't, doesn't work? Confrontational and competitive approaches. So uh, expressing anger and impatience and frustration, threatening the suspect with non-compliance, the consequences of non-compliance or non-cooperation. They say that's counterproductive. Um, a number of our interrogators talked specifically about enhanced interrogation. And while none of them said that, they, that those techniques were most effective, a good portion of them specifically said, said that they were least effective at eliciting reliable information. Now, the study I'm talking to you about happened to be structured interviews, but there have been another number of other studies funded by the HIG to address these issues through surveys, not only in the US, but internationally. And we get a very consistent message across these studies, which is it is rapport and relationship building that underlies a successful interrogation. Um, in terms of the issue of rapport, um, so everybody appears to agree that rapport is important. But it, it becomes even more interesting when you ask people to define what does rapport mean. And things get murkier there. So that even though we all agree, apparently, that it's important, we can't quite agree on what it is. And so you get different definitions. One common definition is that it's a working relationship in which progress can be made between the interrogator and the target. Other people will define it as the person will talk to me, simply talk to me. Others talk about it in terms of liking and mutual respect. So it's a bit. Um, uh, elusive, it's an elusive concept that later studies that Chris will probably touch upon have worked at developing metrics for rapport. But um, we agree, the science agrees that it is important. And we have started to look at how to develop it. So Jane Goodman Delahunty has conducted a study with high value um, uh, interrogators who have who've interrogated high value targets, specifically asking, how do you develop rapport with high value targets? How do you do that? Um, and, and what she finds is they use strategies that are, are um, basic social psychological persuasion principles, like liking. If you want to develop rapport with someone, one of the, the best strategies to use, according to interrogators, is to get them to like you. <laughs> How do you get them to like you? Well, you're, you're nice to them, for starters. You treat them with respect. You, you find commonalities, similarities, use humor. These are the strategies that interrogators tell us use, they use and work with high value targets as well as non high value targets. Um, in the process of conducting these studies, I, for one, um, quickly found out after talking to a, a number of, of operators that interrogation is not just a target and an interrogator in a room. It's, it, especially in the intelligence world, it's often a team approach. So for example, there's, there's often an interpreter in the room. There's an, an, an intelligence analyst who's playing a role. And so we started to realize that we shouldn't just survey interrogators, that we really need to broaden our knowledge base to other interrogation professionals 
And so um, in my lab and with my colleagues, we conducted surveys and interviews of, of highly experienced analysts and highly experienced interpreters. Again, most a uh, good portion of whom or all of whom had high value target experience. And we asked them many of the same questions that we asked our interrogators. Um, but germane to this particular discussion, what is most effective, what is least effective? Remember, these are people who participated in interrogations or watched them firsthand. And again, the message has become very clear. What they think is most effective is relationship and rapport building. What they think is least effective is confrontational competitive approaches. Since that baseline, since those earlier studies where we were looking at really just assessing our knowledge base of what interrogation professionals think work, the HIG has now moved on and started to fund a number of studies, or have funded a number of studies, that took the next step to peer into the booth, so to speak, into the interrogation room and find out whether certain techniques are associated with key outcomes. So does the use of rapport and relationship building actually produce more reliable information and more confessions in the, in the law enforcement realm? And the answer appears to be from that research, yes. So for example, we have studies by Jane Goodman Delahunty, by Allison Redlick and her colleagues, by Lawrence Allison, that look at actual interrogations, videotaped or audiotaped interrogations, to see whether rapport and relationship building techniques or, or contrast that with those other types of techniques, confrontational techniques, what the outcomes are. And we find that rapport and relationship building techniques are associated with eliciting more reliable information, more confessions, and they do it faster earlier in the interview. In, in addition, Lawrence Allison's work in particular, he coded interrogations of actual um, terrorists who had been interrogated. And he found that promoting a suspect's or a target's autonomy in the interrogation room, recognizing the fact that it is their, their choice of whether or not to cooperate, um, building rapport and trust with them is associated with, a more, with eliciting more cooperation and then therefore more information gain. So we've really moved from just know, establishing what we, we thought we knew and being able to assess those perceptions to moving it along to look at what the actual relationship is between these techniques and others. And I think I'm going to let Chris move us on to the, the next step because I'm running out of time. Thank you, Dr. Rosano. <laughs> that was a very good. Uh, by the way, just for the audience, so when we say high value target, I mean, let's define the term. Because uh, it, it's, it's kind of. What do you, uh, Chris or, or Melissa, either one? Do you I think I'll let one yeah. of our operators. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It, it's one of those nebulous definitions, but primarily it, it literally means a terrorist, a, a senior terrorist, uh, uh, you know, somebody with, with depth of access to, to information. Well, or at I least mean, someone who was suspected to be one. Right, yeah. right. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, so we're talking about uh, several dozen people in the world or a uh, hundred? I mean, what's the oh, trying to be potentially hundreds. Yeah. Right. Okay. I, I can say that. Well, we asked our interrogators to define high value target as well. And again, this isn't necessarily something that everybody agrees on the definition, and it can vary by agency. But certainly, someone with higher level strategic information um, that, or potentially has higher level strategic information that could affect policy or could affect um, operations on the ground is a common okay. notion. Uh, Dr. Meissner. Oh, great. And again, Peter, thank, thank you for for having us, and I'll, I'll just take a few minutes and, and sketch out uh, a number of the studies that have been conducted by the, by the HIG over the past four, four and a half years now. Um, Melissa touched on some of those kind of base level studies where we really wanted to understand what operators believed was most effective and, and also to kind of peer into the booth, as she said, to understand what actually is effective and to develop metrics um, for not only uh, the use of certain techniques, but how do you measure those outcomes and how do you measure the observation of rapport in that context. Um, at the same time that we're looking at the, in the real world and with the operators, we're also conducting studies in the laboratories. And we're working with scientists, uh, as was mentioned, all over the world to conduct studies in uh, very controlled experimental conditions. Again, you know, as a scientist, um, uh, double-blind controlled experiments are the gold standard. It's where we learn uh, the, the causal mechanisms that underlie many of these things. But I think you can probably all appreciate the challenges of trying to understand interrogation <laughs> in, a, in a laboratory paradigm, right? <clears throat> so certainly the, the challenges of <clears throat> transposing that process into the laboratory are great, but we can begin to do that in, in um, I think, very relevant ways. And so our scientists have been interested really in <clears throat> kind of three fundamental processes, one having to do with how do you develop cooperation 
in a competitive or adversarial context, right? Number one. Number two, how do you elicit a memory from an individual who was at initially adversarial and is now cooperative? And I, um, you don't hear, I challenge you to um, kind of look into uh, interrogation training programs and to uh, find a place where they talk about memory. It doesn't often happen. In fact, interrogation training programs are really focused on the two other processes, the one being you know, this adversarial to cooperation move, and the other being how do I assess credibility hmm. in that interplay, right? And so while our program is focused on certainly those two fundamental processes that all interrogation professionals are interested in, um, talk to folks like Steve Klein and, and, and Mark Fallon, and you'll quickly learn that memory is at the heart of any interrogation. Any information that you're going to get out of someone has to do with their ability to represent, recall that information with integrity, with accuracy, and hopefully with, uh, with volume. Uh, uh, think about, uh, particularly I think in the intelligence context, and I think Steve, Steve can probably elaborate on this, but uh, intelligence interrogators are interested not just in getting somebody to confess that they committed an act, they're interested in who that person knows, who that person has spoke with, um, who they've encountered, where they've been, all kinds of information that, by the way, I challenge you to think back six months ago to a series of meetings that you had with individuals in your office and to then allow me to question you about the details of those interactions, those conversations, and the outcomes of those. It's a, it's a very challenging task that you're actually asking a detainee to do. And you're doing this, again, in the context of a, of a highly adversarial system <laughs> or process uh, in which the individual is likely reticent to cooperate initially. Um, so the studies that, that have been conducted by the HIG have really focused on those three processes. First, understanding cooperation, understanding rapport, what is meant by rapport, and certainly taking from relevant other literatures, right? So <clears throat> in the medical domains, um, in the clinical domains, they, they've begun to understand rapport, to develop some metrics behind rapport. Um, and we've begun to take some of those metrics and bring them over into, into the interview interrogation context. Uh, we've developed some, some ways of measuring rapport by observation, also by interview. Um, we've also begun to, to take those measurements of rapport and to look at whether they actually predict the elicitation of information in initially adversarial context. Um, we've also looked at the conditions that facilitate or promote rapport. So let me give you a couple of examples. Um, positive versus negative emotional context. Which do you believe are more likely to facilitate rapport? Um, many interrogations actually involve kind of negative emotional approaches that um, are meant to you know, provoke an anxiety, to create some uncertainty, and to try to leverage that in terms of information exchange. It turns out those approaches are actually counterproductive <laughs> to the facilitation of rapport. It's positive emotional approaches and positive emotional contexts that are, that are highly important to the development and predict the development of rapport. Um, the way that you communicate with an individual, the nonverbals that you use, it turns out are very important to the development of rapport, showing of respect, uh, openness of posture, the active posture of leaning in and, and showing interest in the person turn out to be very important to the development of rapport. And then, of course, um, as, as Melissa mentioned, these principles of, of social influence, Bob Cialdini and, and others in social psychology for years, decades, have sought to understand social influence principles and how we um, convince individuals that are initially uncooperative, to become cooperative and to um, concede to requests that we might have. It turns out these principles are very important in the development of rapport. Liking was talked about, uh, similarities talked about, reciprocity. Uh, uh, Steve Kleinman can offer some, I think, very vivid examples of those in the, in the interrogation context. We've studied those, uh, not only, I think, uh, uh, you've mentioned Jane Goodman, Dale Hunty's uh, work at looking at those in kind of real interrogation context. Uh, we've also sought to experimentally manipulate uh, the use of those, those principles of rapport 
in, in an interview uh, interrogation context and look at whether that leads to cooperation and elicitation of information. In fact, it does. Um, so that's the cooperation edge of it. Very quickly, the memory edge of it, which, which again, incredibly important. There have been decades of research on memory, how memory operates, when memory fails, uh, interview techniques that are likely to lead to misinformation uh, or false memories, uh, and interview protocols that are likely to facilitate uh, the collection of information. And we've focused on all of those, but really have keyed in on research uh, by Ron Fisher, Ed Geiselman, and others looking at what's called the cognitive interview. A few years ago, some colleagues and I did a meta-analysis of that literature. It's over three decades of research now on the cognitive interview, um, showing very robust, consistent effects of eliciting additional information. And the cognitive interview works not only by an understanding of the uh, of proper communication uh, with an individual and development of cooperation, um, the giving over of autonomy to the person who, who is providing you the information, but then relies, most importantly, I think, on principles of memory and the mnemonics that can enhance recall of information. You can't do, by the way, you can't do a cognitive interview with a non-cooperative individual. It's not, not really going to work. You need somebody who's responding to you. So, so any use of a cognitive interview comes at the point in which you've developed cooperation, you have an, an individual who's willing now to engage with you in some exchange. Um, we've done a number of studies with Ron and other colleagues on on the cognitive interview. Uh, and by the way, I should mention here, not only laboratory studies, but once these studies, once these techniques have been kind of honed, developed, replicated, we, we show robustness of the technique. We actually work with the training academies, and that's one of the great things about the HIG project, I think, is that they've, um, they've connected us up with the federal training facilities that are very interested in, in kind of vetting and understanding the science as it develops. Those training academies that have actually offered us an opportunity to bring the science-based methods to the training academy and to conduct experiments at the training academy that pit the science-based method against existing practice. We've done this now a handful of times, and in each of the cases, the science method beats the existing practice. And let me just give you the example of the cognitive interview. The cognitive interview was put up against uh, what, what um, Federal Law Enforcement Training Center calls their five-step method. I think of it as a bit of a dance, but it's, um, it's a very um, uh, good interview protocol that's trained to, to all kind of federal investigators. The cognitive interview in these experiments doubled the amount of information elicited from a source compared with the five-step method. Again, the science-based methods are very robust and rely on this understanding of how memory works. Finally, detecting deception. This is what actually every law enforcement investigator or intelligence uh, interrogator is very interested in. So in the context of, of an interview, how do I assess credibility of information that's <coughs> excuse me, coming, coming to me? <coughs> the, the very unscientific folklore is to look at nonverbals, right? <coughs> Avoiding eye contact, nervousness, fidgeting, those types of things. In fact, now, um, a great deal of research looking at those cues to deception, um, consistently demonstrating that nonverbals, generally unreliable and unpredictive of truth or, or false uh, information, deceit. Um, so what does predict veracity? It turns out that the, some of the best predictors of veracity have to do with how people tell their stories, how they convey information and how memory operates in that context. And I think one of the neat findings that we've had is the relationship between the way that you interview to elicit information from memory, having these corollary benefits on magnifying the differences between liars and truth tellers. Uh, by the way, this has been looked at not only in, in the context of the HIG, but there's a very prominent study just published in JEP General in which <coughs> one of our um, major transportation uh, agencies did a trial looking at these techniques um, for distinguishing liars and truth tellers um, attempting to pass through a screening environment. Here again showing that these strategic questioning techniques um, better separate liars and truth tellers because of the way that they tell their stories. Let me just give you a couple of examples very quickly. <coughs> 
lying is difficult. I don't know if you've ever lied before in your life, but <clears throat> it turns out that lying is cognitively challenging. I try not to lie because I just am not good at it. <laughs> and keeping everything <clears throat> straight is quite a challenging task. So think about what you do when you lie. Um, you are, first of all, suppressing the truth and trying not to leak the truth. At the, time to, at the same time, you've created now a lie that you're attempting to keep straight. And there may be certain strategies associated with that. You may try to keep it as simple as possible. You may try to rely on some existing knowledge. But you've got to maintain that lie in a way that you remember what you've said so that you don't contradict yourself. At the same time, if you're in an interview context, <coughs> you're also monitoring the person that you're talking to to assess whether they're believing you, right? And at the same time that you're doing that, you're also monitoring your own behaviors because you don't want to leak those behaviors that you believe are indicative of lying. Lying is cognitively challenging. And so uh, mm -hmm. our researchers, Albert Vry, Par Anders Granhag, uh, Maria Hardwig, uh, have been leveraging that kind of social and cognitive psychological understanding of lying and turning it on its head in terms of strategic interviewing approaches. How can we tax the system of the liar in ways that magnify the differences between liars and truth tellers? One more example, uh, evidence. It turns out if you look at studies on, on interrogation and what yields confessions, evidence is a very important predictor of somebody's likelihood of confessing, their perception of the evidence against them. How do we use evidence in, in law enforcement and, and um, military interrogations? Well, oftentimes, um, interrogators will leverage evidence as a way of kind of maximizing a suspect's perception uh, that, they, that the case is essentially closed and they have to cooperate. And they'll present evidence very early in an interrogation. What, what uh, Maria Hartwig and, and Par Anders Granhag and others have found is that um, it's actually much more effective if you hold your cards, so to speak. And that you, if you can kind of get the individual talking, develop some rapport, elicit a narrative from them, all the while holding your cards, not revealing necessarily what you know, the information that you have. And then once you've kind of locked them into a narrative, locked them into a story, then begin to <clears throat> very strategically, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> use that evidence. Not to, not to lay it out all at once, but to kind of leak it very strategically and in ways that begin to test the subject's account and to identify those contradictions. And, and you can imagine just the, the um, analogy of kind of painting them into a corner. Um, subjects, after two or three rounds of this in which evidence is presented and they have to kind of change their story, mm. modify their narrative to account for this, they quickly learn that this is going to be a long and fruitless um, account and that I might as well, okay, I, I see that you have more information than you let on initially and, um, and now I need to change my approach. <clears throat> so as I mentioned, uh, we've, we've uh, conducted uh, quite a bit of research. I don't want to leave you though with the impression that we've solved all of the problems. Um, this, is a, this has been a four and a half, five year effort. Um, and any of you know uh, anything about science, you don't solve problems in five years. Right? Uh, we're beginning to understand, we're beginning to identify those uh, processes and techniques that show promise. We're also exploring some other areas like the effects of interpreters, as, as Melissa mentioned, <coughs> and the effect of context. So just one last example. The room, the interrogation room, the kind of stereotype of the interrogation room, cold, um, closed, uh, dimly lit, hard chair, hard table, locked door, all of those things psychologically actually signal uh, a lower likelihood of, of sharing information, right? In fact, it's a warm environment, a comfortable environment, an open environment that facilitates disclosure. So even uh, now conducting studies in which we look at the environment itself and the cues that are offered and how that might begin to facilitate disclosure uh, communication and openness. So I think I'll stop there. And Thank you, sir. <coughs> Colonel Kleiman. Yeah, Peter, it's an honor to be with you here and, and really thankful to New America for affording us this opportunity. It's always a pleasure and honor to be with my colleagues. Uh, here we are, 2015, and there should be a celebration. 
commemorative stamp should be issued by the post office. You know, Congress should, should lay down a, a, a proclamation honoring a platinum anniversary, the 70th anniversary of the Army Field Manual. It was established in 1945 as 3015, reestablished in 1987 as 3254, and then in 2006 as 22-2.3. 70 years of tradition absolutely unhampered by progress, which is quite a thing to say. You know, we have two uh, preeminent behavioral scientists before you who have witnessed in their own careers and, and in the generations that came before them, just over, let's say, the same 70 years, the dramatic leaps in our understanding of behavioral science. They've taught us so much about how people think, how they reason, how they weigh evidence, how they make judgments. You know, psychologists have taught us about how people interact with their environment and how the, the environment directly interacts or, or influences their decisions. None of that information, none of that information has found its way into the Army Field Manual. Now that's regrettable because we are still in the middle of a global war on terror and interrogation has, has still remained a very important part of the intelligence uh, effort. But it is informed in large part by the Army Field Manual. Now, that in and of itself would be problematic, but it's, it's worsened by the fact, you know, for, and forgive me for portraying it in that, that way, but on his second day in office, President Obama signed, into, uh, signed Executive Order 13491, Ensuring Lawful Interrogations, which you can tell by the title was an extremely well-intentioned effort. The problem in my professional view was it established the Army Field Manual as the standard to be used by anybody representing the United States government in an armed conflict. Now, as I've mentioned, the model of interrogation, approximately 19 approaches, depending on how you count them, uh, are, are unchanged. In fact, in 2006, the only difference was they added, they added a false flag, where we could pretend to be from another country, or isolation, which is ex definitely problematic. And they added back Mutt and Jeff, you know, which you all know as a good cop, bad cop. That was, that was taking 70 years of behavioral science research and moving forward into, the, into this century. In the global war on terror, in this asymmetric environment, we've talked about high value targets. What type of individuals are we encountering? Let's take Khalid Sheikh Mohammed as a good example. Somebody who has an advanced technical degree, speaks multiple languages, has moved fairly gracefully across cultural lines, knows far more about American culture than the average American interrogator knows about his culture. So who's at the advantage? And then if we're, again, if we're, our hands are bound by what we know from the Army Field Manual, which was designed, I may, might add, for conventional military and military uh, uh, conflict, where essentially you have young military interrogators interrogating young uh, infantry officers from the Red Army as the Soviet Army moved through the Fulda Gap back in the Cold War era. It's not adaptive, not ready to move forward into the 21st century. Now, if I were to look back, and I think Mark will, will share this, this, this view, from our experience, I, I think I'd speak for Mark, it's, we, we've probably learned three things. <laughs> Hopefully, Mark probably many more, but <laughs> I've learned three things. Number one, interrogation remains absolutely relevant in today's uh, environment. A lot of people didn't think it would because you know, we have an unsurpassed capability in technical intelligence. But interrogation in this new era is just as important as the interrogation in the old era. And the old era can be traced back to antiquity. It's one of the oldest methods of collecting intelligence. Secondly, technical intelligence is absolutely necessary, but also absolutely insufficient to get the information we need to inform an adaptive foreign policy going forward. And the third thing I learned is that if we were simply left to draw on our own conclusions form causal relationships by looking at my own experience, I'm going to make lots and lots of errors. I've had the wonderful experience in the last decade of working with researchers such as my colleagues here. And I've described it to them as kind of like being in a minor car wreck. It takes a while for your head to clear because I've realized <laughs> a lot of things that I thought were true were simply not. Or the connections I made were more correlation than, than causation. But now I've almost become the other side where I, I embrace science so deeply, it, I'm, I'm perhaps too quick to say it's, it's the answers. But what Chris has taught me very clearly is what, what science can do is no, it's not going to offer certainties. That's, it, it can't do that. But what it will do is, is incrementally, systematically, and continuously increase the, the 
probability. It's a probabilistic equation that if we take certain actions, we have a higher and higher probability of achieving very specific outcomes. Now that is a lot better than 70 years of going nowhere. And, but, but the key is this research effort, it's not a linear process. It's not, you know, there's definitely a beginning and we're very close to it still, but there's no end state. It is a cycle. And the way this cycle unfolds is, as Melissa talked about in her remarks, it begins with applied, uh, excuse me, basic research. Because even though there's been uh, research going on in the law enforcement uh, context, learning more about how it applies in the intelligence context is very new in terms of interrogation. So science is still, we're kind of near the, the, the beginning point, but we've gone through a uh, basic, now we're getting to apply, taking those theoretical ideas, those conclusions, and beginning to test them under more real and more real conditions to the point where we're field testing this certain amount of operational vetting. Experiments done properly do replicate the real world, but there's always that question, will it transfer? And so rather than taking that in, in what we call training, it, it, I, I love the term that's, that's emerged, research to practice. They've taken what research has, has demonstrated and what field testing has demonstrated to be probabilistic in terms of, of, of useful methods, and now are, are, are using that, are training new groups of people, new law enforcement intelligence agencies that are in, uh, turning around and using that immediately. And the feedback thus far, I mean, I, I will, I want to give out kudos to the Air Force Office of Special Investigations. They have really taken the lead in a very bold and a very 21st century way. They have, lot, they have decades of experience, just like other law enforcement intelligence agencies, but they've said science can answer more questions. Can we get better at what we do? And so they've embraced it. Other uh, agencies have been interested in several large metropolitan police departments have reached out to us to, to ask us, can you refine our approach, and, and I, I, think we, I think we can. The feedback we get so, so far has been very gratifying, uh, not just here in the United States, also uh, in, in our, some of our allied nations. It it's, comes in, in variations of these themes. Number one is, oh, I wish I would have known this 20 years ago, or I can't wait to use this on a case I'm working with, or for the first time, somebody has told me how things work, why they work, rather than just telling me to use them, because now I can adapt that to a wider range of challenges, and I can more effectively train that next generation of, of professionals. So let, let me end my, my comments with, with a little bit of science. I, I've, I've learned so much about how I see the world and sometimes is not necessarily the correct one in terms of a, an accurate portrayal of it. So there's heuristics, there's, there's these, these shortcuts, mental shortcuts that we take. And one's called the availability heuristic. And when we're thinking about making a decision, we think about examples, and the ones that are immediately available to us, mostly the ones that are recent or have some dramatic impact, will shape our view. And how this applies is when, when the average person thinks about interrogation, or more importantly, how policymakers think about interrogation, they are less influenced by Dr. Meisner, Dr. Rosano, or Dr. Uh, the other colleagues we have, but more by television shows. You know, you have 24, I, I don't know if there's anybody who hadn't seen an interrogation, a fictional portrayal of an interrogation written by screenwriters who have never seen a real interrogation, but it's ubiquitous. You know, it's the tyranny of the ubiquity on this, and that they cannot help but escape. That's what shapes their perspective, and so I would argue that National security and, and the role that interrogation plays in it, we cannot, we cannot rely on something designed for entertainment. We need to look towards science, which is designed for enlightenment. And I think that's where we get to the next, the next place. Well, those were four really brilliant uh, expositions. And you, know, you raised, I think, a very good point, uh, because I think uh, I, it's completely unscientific, what I'm going to say. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I think that movies actually influence the way that the CIA program was constructed. Because what, is the co what was the commonality of everybody who made a decision, whether it was in the White House or at the agency? None of them had ever done an interrogation. None of them had, had ever been federal prosecutors. None of them had been in the FBI, right? They just had no idea. Mm -hmm. And so they, as you said, they sort of, if you want to get information, you're going to discomfort somebody. And that's the way to do it. So uh, I think it's been a very powerful, uh, uh, and of course, we had Zero Dark Thirty, which kind of you know made that connection, and I think in a kind of very unfair way in terms of 
you know, the torture of this guy led to bin Laden. I think mm -hmm. the CIA report basically puts that to rest. And I think if the, I, I, Mark, I agree completely with about the report. I mean, I think that what historians, you know, the 9-11 Commission was an amazing work of history. And, and I think this is also a very useful piece of history because you can sort of critique it and say, well, we didn't talk to the CIA officers involved. I think that's a slightly unfair critique for the following reason. First of all, uh, documents don't lie. They can be misleading in some ways, but people's <coughs> memories of something that happened 10 years ago are less effective than the actual documents. And, and, and secondly, um, the, they did have uh, access to the IG, who, in, who interviewed about 100 of the CIA officers in around more in the contemporary time frame. So I think historians will be using this for, you know, for a long time, uh, particularly the footnotes are very rich. But let me ask you some just a question before I throw it over to the audience. One is the question, uh, you know, it's always, I mean, this is perhaps for the professional interrogators to start with. So obviously respect is a very useful trait in an interview, but you're interviewing people that, who, for whom you fundamentally have no respect for, if it's, let's say, Halid Sheikh Mohammed or, so how do you, I mean, is it a form of acting or what, how, or do you, is, or is it, if you have the right level of empathy, you can put yourself in that place. So how do you get to that point where you respect somebody in an interrogation who fundamentally you think is a you know, threat to national security? Sure. I mean, I'll, you know, I'll take it to start with. Uh, you do it as a professional. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, it, it's your job. Uh, you know, through, through my career, I've had to uh, interview and interrogate pedophiles, rapists, murderers, uh, people who've committed espionage. Mm. So, so what you do is, as a professional, you understand that your job is to elicit accurate and reliable information. And, and you do what you can lawfully to ensure that you can elicit that information for your case, for your investigation, for your operation, to, to gather uh, some type of communication from that individual that will be useful to apply to whether, whether it's intelligence or for evidence, evidentiary purposes. So, but, but it, I mean, you have to take a couple breaths sometimes and, mm -hmm. and, and forget about the why I ought us and uh, go in there and, and your goal is to elicit uh, information. Can I attempt to that? Yeah. I, and I think this is important in, in the larger scope. Uh, Mark is absolutely correct about professionalism. There's been a lot of discussion about, okay, we need to remember, especially in light of the release of the Senate report, we need to remember the zeitgeist at the moment, the fear, the anger, the desire for revenge. Mm. That was all real, absolutely. But people like Mark Fallon is not paid to have an emotion or an opinion about the person sitting across from him, other than a professional assessment. It's okay for the citizenry to be fearful and to want revenge, but they, that citizenry also pays us to, to be very, very professional, to thoughtfully approach this and sit across from anybody under any circumstances and use science and oper operationally vetted technologies to elicit useful information. So it's, uh, it's respecting the challenge as opposed to respecting the individual. Can I ask you another one, one thing that I think I was sort of surprised you didn't necessarily talk about it, because Ali Soufan um, you know, talks about knowledge. I mean, so when he encountered somebody in Al-Qaeda, I mean, he knew, like, you know, he, I mean, you, you obviously worked with him at some point, yeah. and um, so he knew probably more about Al-Qaeda than the person sitting across from him. So to what extent, that's a little bit different than having the evidence that you're going to bring in later. It's, that's a slightly different issue. So what, wh how does that play? Yeah, yeah, the, 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 there's a lot of people out there who talk about detecting deception and, and what, what did looking up your eyes to the right mean or to the left mean and, and other things. Uh, the most useful way to detect deception is either a checkable fact or prior knowledge. It's knowledge. Mm. It's your ability. So what, what, what Ali Safan did and Bob McFadden and other folks yeah. who, who, who've interrogated for years uh, did is, is they use their knowledge, they use their wits to actually outsmart the individual they were interrogating. So it does come into play and that's why preparation is key. Mm -hmm. It's understanding your target, it's understanding the individual, it's understanding your subject matter so you know when to throw the BS flag. And you strategically use it to your advantage. Sometimes you might let them wrap around themselves, sometimes you might challenge them a little bit. But, but it's that prior knowledge that helps you and that's what helped Ollie and others that I know be very successful because, because they, they could throw the BS flag. Now, now both Ali and Bob McFadden speak Arabic. Correct. Mm -hmm. Right. So that's a. So how does? And you mentioned the interpreter as being sort of a. So I mean, obviously, if you if you don't have an interpreter, that's a plus, is it? Or that's an interesting question. I think ideally, if you're speaking fluently the same language as the person most interrogators would probably prefer that. However, I've 
a, num a number of the interrogators that I've, I've had the, the um, pleasure of speaking with who spoke Arabic chose to use an interpreter strategically. Huh. So oh, um, I don't know that Even it's Bob a... Even Yeah. Right. I don't know that it's a one that he understood size the cultural down. nuance coming out of an individual. Yeah. So right. we would never want to even And interpreters alone. can be used in your favor as well. There are ways to leverage the use of an interpreter. They're subject matter experts in the well, culture that they You raise a very interesting point, which is like in a very, like, uh, the, let's look at the interrogation of Saddam Hussein. George okay. Pirro spoke mm -hmm. Arabic. Um, you know, as far as Saddam was concerned, there was just this one guy. He thought that George Pirro was like, you know, talking to George Bush every day. And he didn't understand that he was actually an FBI sort of, you know, he, <laughs> but, but behind George Pirro, there was a huge group of people that were also participating in the interrogation in some way, right? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. That's right. Yeah. So what, how does that sort of affect things? And I mean, you've done some, you mentioned you, mm -hmm. you kind of, who, who are the people behind that? When you've got the one guy in the booth and the subject doesn't really understand that there are a lot of other people out there who may be supplying questions or. Right. Well, I think when you're when, in the context of an intelligence uh, interrogation, there are, there, there, it is a team. Um, the the an analysts, as I mentioned earlier, um, are critical for to support the interrogator in, in terms of providing subject matter expertise about that particular target, that particular culture that the target's from, the group that they're from, and they are working hopefully hand in hand with the interrogator to supply the the information that the interrogator needs in order to be prepared and to be able to kind of fact check on the scene. So um, it very much is a team effort. And again, the interpreter, if if there is one in the room. I think depending on the comfort level of the, the interrogator and the interpreter, they can also be used um, for that for that type of information as well. well Peter, let me just add there, yeah. because uh, even in the law enforcement context, yeah. uh, I mean, in, in the CITF uh, in interviews and interrogations at Guantanamo, it was always done by a team. You, you would mm. have folks who would be observing, who, who might be behavioral scientists, would be analysts, might be lawyers, but, but there was always a support team. It's never as the movie depicts as the, mm -hmm. you know, the one guy with the lamp uh, <laughs> in, the, in the shadows kind of talking to somebody. Uh, it's most effective when you have a team because there's also a thing called cognitive load. And, and, and so cognitive. cognitive load, it's your ability to process information. That, that's the problem I have with, with some of these techniques we're asking an interrogator to do because it's placing cognitive load on the individual who should be listening and should be developing his own strategy to go against the individual rather than, I'll just use the eyes right or left example, or, or whatever, whatever your, your magic bullet of deception might be. So what often I find, and I still help train interrogators, is those folks observing will be able to point out things that that interrogator doesn't realize. Mm -hmm. Because you are so focused mm -hmm. on listening to information that that support team when you come out says, did you realize you did that? By the way, uh, speaking of which, uh, you know, if we have an Al Qaeda, somebody from Al Qaeda who's been interrogated, is it effective to have a female interrogator or not effective, or it doesn't, or it's sort of a wash? Yeah, actually, my view on that has changed. Yeah. Uh, when when, when uh, I was first assigned to the CITF, and uh, the director of NCIS allowed me to to, to kind of help pick who was coming to uh, help from NCIS to the task force, and, and I actually thought that it would be a, a disadvantage to some of the females and it might put them at a position uh, where, where they might fail. And I was absolutely wrong. We brought some on board, and actually some of our, our better interrogators were women. And, and so, so my opinion changed 180. It, it did, it, we're all human beings, uh, and, and certainly even that culture has a high uh, degree of respect uh, for the maternal image and, and things like that. And, and, and so I have found uh, that women are, can be very effective. How about uh, sociopaths who, because you mentioned lying is something that you're trying to detect. I mean, but sociopaths can lie without, um, they don't have the same cognitive problems that you mentioned, right, about forming a lie, perhaps, or am I getting this wrong? <coughs> They're going to be under some of the same uh, cognitive load issues that, that we talked about. Um, they, they probably are more likely to have uh, convinced themselves of, of the certainty of certain things and um, uh, they, they tend to be better liars. We know there's, there's data on that. There are certainly challenges in that context. And um, I don't think we've got great data in terms of the, um, the detection rates on, on sociopaths. Right. And I, I think that raises an issue, too. A lot of uh, detection deception research, and certainly the practice, <coughs> is based on, on an anxiety-based model. And so people have these moral qualms about lying, and so it's going to be exhibited through various uh, nonverbal behaviors, when, in fact, as we've already expressed here, really it's more an information uh, assessment game. The quality mm -hmm. of the information, the timing of the information, the comprehensive nature of it. So
So as Chris just mentioned, even if somebody who had absolutely no, you know, beyond a sociopath, somebody who feels it's their duty to lie to you, therefore would have no moral and therefore no anxiety to produce from it, they're still going to have problems from a strategic or tactical level being able to lie effectively. Way, just so it, when you're in normal life, you've, both of you have spent decades interrogating people. Do you notice when people are lying to you just when there's a normal interactions in a way that it would be hard for a, a sort of civilian to do so? In social setting? Yeah. I'm horrible at that. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we, we wait for the mic and we'll take Tara Marrow for the first question at the back. Hi. That was fascinating. I have a quick question touching upon the last few points that you made. So you've spoken a lot about the subject's ability to lie or things that might give it away and the ability of the interrogator to be trained. But I mean, you touched on it with the, with the women point that you just made. There are innate qualities that might be innate in certain people for different reasons, varying on age or gender. Um, and there were spe specific tests. There was a recent article in the New York Times by uh, an MIT study showing what made teams smarter. And it showed that certain types of teams, actually with women, had the ability to had higher theory of mind scores, which are, is the ability to detect mm -hmm. subtle emotional cues mm -hmm. and facial mm -hmm. readings that they might not even know they have because they weren't tested for before. So I was wondering if you could speak to innate qualities that might make someone primed to be a better interrogator. And if we screen and try to tap those people to be interrogators, pre-train any sort of training. Mm -hmm. I'd, like to do, I'd like to start that. Mm -hmm. um, probably, I think the single most important quality of the best interrogators I've either known or I've studied in historical examples, it's a quality that has surprised the average person. That is empathy. And you've, you've touched on that. The, abil the ability not to say, gosh, how would I respond if I was in these circumstances? That's not empathy. You know, that's just projection. Mm. But empathy is saying, if I was born in Basra, and I had been brought up in a, a despotic political system that suddenly anarchy reigns, be able to get all the detail, how would I see this person from America asking me questions? So, and, and I, I'm really probably on thin ice here, but my understanding is, just as you've said, going back to gender issues, maybe, maybe it's learned, maybe it's, it's cultural, maybe it's innate brain structure, but, and they can address that. But, but the higher levels of empathy, which I think we do associate more often with females than males, I think is, is a, a, a really advantageous quality to have. Does the science have anything to say? Well, I mean, I'll, just, I'll just say this is a question that, that the HIG has been asked a lot and that uh, we've continued to explore. Um, we have teams that have been um, working on competency models and selection um, metrics that could be used by training facilities and um, uh, interrogation um, uh, teams to begin to select for those qualities. I, I don't know that we have great evidence to kind of support the innate characteristics being great predictors of uh, successful interrogators. In fact, you could argue that um, empathy can be trained at, at some level. There's some, there's some evidence there. So, you know, I, I think it's an ongoing question. I don't think it's a settled question, but it's a question we get a lot and that the HIG's still investing resources and in trying to understand that certainly many of the training facilities are, are keen in on, on that question. Oh. Hugh Grindstaff, does it change in operational and situational uh, environments? In other words, if you're on the battlefield, your interrogation might be a little bit more intense, or because you, you don't know, you you don't ha you haven't had time to study the person that you you're trying to interrogate. Well, uh, Steve is probably more familiar with that th 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 than I am on the battlefield like that. But, but I mean, as we studied how we should uh, approach our interrogations at the CITF, uh, it, we, we did look at uh, the phenomenon ca called capture shock. A and in those first moments, what, what might come out of someone uh, after a certain amount of period, it, it dissipates rather quickly <laughs> uh, to the point generally uh, if it's an NCIS agent or a CITF, agent who is going to be talking to somebody, it's generally a, a little bit of time after that initial capture by the time they, they would get to, to us. But Steve, right, you've, right. you've been out there more than this than I Yeah, have. Yeah, capture shock, I think, is a double-edged sword because people often are less guarded about what they say, but they also say things that are just not true. I mean, out of the, the deep anxiety over having been captured by a foreign enemy. And I, I think your, your point, though, sir, in a larger context is so critical. And it speaks to about torture, as if that's, that's a, in case of fire, you break glass, pull the lever. You know, and so torture works. You shouldn't use it, but if you need to, it's there. There's a, there's a time element of interrogation that is just unavoidable. It's a systematic, strategically patient approach 
where the principles apply whether it's on the battlefield or whether it's down in Guantanamo or whether it's in a police station. There are certain things that simply cannot be rushed. Now, you mentioned the good point, and, and Mark uh, emphasized having more and more information puts you in a, at an advantage. So you're really operating with a blank slate. So you're much more, more easily duped, you know, falling for a lie. Uh, how, do you, how do you connect with this person? And that's where it goes to some maybe perhaps innate qualities where people are able to establish rapport quickly. But wouldn't that be a point of where torture would work? No. Uh, it would, I, I can't imagine in any circumstance. It might get you bad information more quickly. <laughs> yeah, right. At the same time. <laughs> Hi, uh, Adam Zagarin. Um, I think the nature of the kind of scientific approach that you have is that uh, um, it, it, it leads to the development of best practices and, and for training and so forth and what works and what doesn't. But the uh, debate in this country, and including the political debate, is that uh, there's a number of, uh, any number of people, including very high former office holders, who uh, have taken a somewhat different position. And um, one of the w <coughs> arguments that they make, or that might be made, is that, well, so these are best practices, but of course there's outliers and exceptions, which is just mm -hmm. a given. Mm -hmm. And then they use that argument, and, and, and we remember the old argument of, you know, the bomb in New York City, and you have 20 minutes, and what are you going to do? And they've extrapolated from that into a whole variety of justifications for uh, reprehensible practices. Uh, not to say possibly illegal ones, but so so. W what about uh, when best practices are not working? Uh, be because, and I say this not to justify uh, other techniques, but this is inherent in a conversation that seems to still be going on today, including reactions to uh, the torture report, where people made all sorts of comments and basically said the report is full of it, and so on and so forth. So um, how do we deal with that piece of argumentation? And, you know, can I just add to that? Because you're telling us that the science is all going in one direction. Mm -hmm. And yet, if you look at public polling data in the United States, support for torture has actually gone up at the same time that the evidence-based approach to this issue has actually produced more evidence showing an alternative approach actually works. So why is that? Well, well the, the other thing that I will tell you that I am telling you is not just the science tells us that, but, but so do the practitioners. Right, right. And, 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 and so, so that, that's uh, the, the, some of the people that, Adam, and it's nice to finally kind of meet you. I know we've, we've spoken on the phone in the past. Um, it, you know, many of them are uninformed. And, and if a best practice is not working, I would suggest not to gravitate to a worse practice. <laughs> uh, you know, and, and, and so, and, and this time, this time element, you know, I always kind of laugh at this ticking time bomb theory, and I know Steve grovels about it a little bit. <laughs> if, if you look at the, the EITs or the torture, and it was torture that they did, uh, and um, obviously not, not a political figure, uh, and, and, and so I won't couch those words. Uh, it was torture, and we did torture people, but, but if you look at Abu Zubaydah, uh, we spent weeks with nobody talking to him, mm -hmm. where he was in complete isolation. How is that quicker than developing a rapport, getting information? What, what the research would tell us is that about 30% of the people are predisposed to give you information when captured. So the first point is don't screw it up. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, don't do something that's going to derail them. And, and if you read the torture report, you will see that detainee after detainee was actually abused right off the bat. And, 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 and so right, right away you have now shut off almost one-third of the people who might be there to actually tell you information. And, 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 it, and it also details those who are actually talking. And then they started getting abusive with them and aggressive with them, and then they stopped talking. So I, I have yet to see anything uh, that would lead me to conclude that applying that type of pressure or ab abuse or torture would actually result in the elicitation of accurate, reliable information. It will get you corrupted information mm -hmm. And, and, and we saw that with Ibn Sheikh al Libby. Mm. I mean, he was an emir of al-Qaeda training camp, and under pressure and duress, he had said there was al-Qaeda in Iraq, and Colin Powell went before the United Nations and used that information to bring us to war. 
So, so it is not just ineffective. It, we've lost lives. I mean, we justified a war based on fabricated information that a detainee later said, yeah, I said that. I, I made it up so that the pain would stop. C C and just to clarify, he was an Egyptian prison at the time, right? It wasn't we went off. I don't know what's classified or not classified. Yeah, we, we didn't. Yeah, did. yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, 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 he was, but so, he was being yeah. held by a. Yeah, he, yeah, because you know, we turned him over. So, but yeah, he's also he's also dead now. Yeah. yeah. So, so we we can't talk to him anymore. <laughs> let me let me just add to this. So th there's about a third that are going to walk into the booth, and they're actually going to cooperate off the bat. There's another segment that are going to be continually resistant, likely no matter what you do. Mm -hmm. Right, mm -hmm. and so let me just let let's just ask the operator, Steve. Yeah, that, what do you do in that yeah, situation? It, it, I have a formula for that. So <laughs> like to, it's, it's, it's called uh, it's called S W cubed N. Some will, some won't. So what next? You know, you, and and that's true. Any anybody with real experience who's going to be honest about it will tell you that not everybody, under any circumstances, no matter what you do, will be able to answer questions accurately in a timely fashion, in a comprehensive nature. And that's what we're after. Yeah, yes, you can make people talk, but maybe it's about intelligence, maybe it's corrupt, as Mark said. And that's the key to remember, is any intelligence gathering uh, technology or strategy has limits. And to push past it is an unsophisticated, immature, and unprofessional approach to your craft. So to say that you know, if this doesn't work, we push further. Same thing with signals intelligence, you know, imagery. You can take photos from geosynchronous orbit. Works great. But if we walked into Putin's office and we're taking snapshots, it might not work so well. They might detect what's going on. <laughs> so, I mean, there's limits to, to every, every intelligence method. This gentleman in front. Well, you know, what, one of my favorite parts of the CIA report is KSM said there was a cell, an African-American Muslim cell in Montana that was part of Al-Qaeda. So, I mean. Look at the <laughs> resources we wasted tracking down those false leads. Yeah. Uh, folks right. that could have been applied to actually investigating Al-Qaeda. Hi, I'm Pat Pugh. Um, something that you said uh, when uh, Mr. Bergman was defining high value target struck me is that the, uh, the sample is maybe in the hundreds. And that would uh, strike me as being more of a qualitative um, study rather than a, uh, you know, a quantitative study. Mm -hmm. um, did the HIG uh, consider looking at um, state and local uh, law enforcement interviewers, interrogators, yeah. and I think there is, from my my background, there is a separation between interview and interrogation. Um, maybe uh, there's a distinction between the folks that you, you're interviewing, where you know they're not interested in you know once they're captured in getting their release, their interest is in operational security versus you know, maybe a street level uh, criminal who is, uh, you know, interested in, you know, convincing you of his interest or his innocence. Um, but, uh, you know, I would think that, you know, gang intelligence investigators, mm -hmm. folks that are doing organized crime, you know, where you're doing link analysis and, you know, targeting work, you know, have something to uh, contribute to, to that type of study. Can I address, I'll start, uh, if you don't mind. So the beauty of the HIG program is that we've been able to, um, coordinate and to look at many levels of, of and types of interrogation. So not only the, the high value context, but, but certainly the state, local, federal law enforcement context. Um, and I think you bring up a great point there, there at the end. Um, the uh, the uh, relationship between kind of gang link analysis um, investigations and uh, intelligence uh, interrogations, uh, very clear to, to us. There, there certainly are some um, maybe distinct typologies of interrogations that can be ducted, conducted that might be separated by crime type. But one thing I'll just kind of leave you with and I'll let others respond. Um, many of the techniques that we see um, operating successfully in one sector and with one uh, type of, of subject uh, operate as effectively in the, in the other context. So, so while the investigations may be different, um, while the, the type of information you're after may be different, a lot of the fundamental processes that are effective here uh, transcend those those typologies. Yeah, and I'll, I'll add to that as well that, you know, when I started um, doing these systematic interviews with interrogators who had varied experience, so some were former law enforcement, FBI, NCIS, 
um, but also Army intelligence and, and whatnot. You know, it, a lot of people told me up front, you know, there, there's a big difference between a law enforcement interrogation and intelligence interrogation. We're after different things. In the law enforcement context, you're after a confession, whereas we're no, we don't care about that a lot of times. We just want information. We're not worried about prosecution. And so they started out, a lot of them started out by telling me that. And then I quickly learned, though, that the techniques that they use, how to actually elicit information, are really not that different. They may think it's different. They may talk about it in different terms. But the underlying strategies of what's most effective transcend the context of the, the nature of the offense, um, so to speak. So, um, but yes, we have tapped into those resources and continue to tap into those resources. The lady right in the back. Um, thank you. This is a wonderful panel. I'm Diane Perlman at the School for Conflict Analysis and Resolution at George Mason. Also a clinical psychologist and have close friends and colleagues who were involved in this work. And there's a journal, Peace and Conflict, issue on this from a few years ago. So um, a question, in your experience or knowledge, do you have experienced something, a phenomenon similar to like the Stockholm Syndrome or traumatic bonding where people feel safe and, you know, and unload to you or have some kind of awareness about their experience or do you ever have any experiences, I would call people sort of, um, sort of changing like any Thing like redemption or anything like that? That's an excellent question. I, I've had a couple very curious experiences that, that have taught me to be cautious about how persuasive, how persuasive persuasion can be. <laughs> uh, Saul Kasson has this, this wonderful spectrum of, of persuasion, social influence. On one side, you have absolute defiance, and the other side, you have compliance. And a lot of interrogators, oh, I want somebody compliant. I'd say, not so much. I want somebody to have enough independence when I'm saying that you know, the bomb is in Central Park tomorrow, they're gonna, and they know it's not, they're telling me it's, it's not. But I've had situations, we've learned a lot about the power of mimicry, uh, the power of, uh, you mentioned Dr. Cialdini's Six Principles of Persuasion. I've had some people in 2003 in Baghdad, uh, one gentleman in particular, in this, in, I, I, I was a very reasonable appearing, very empathetic individual in the midst of chaos. And they bonded with me so deep. When I ended up passing this person off, they became from a, from a prisoner to a recruited and run agent. Uh, the, the, the counterintelligence agent finally said, sir, can I talk to you outside for a moment? I said, yeah, what's up? He said, you have to leave. I said, you know, that's kind of rude. He said, no, no, no. Watch. When we ask this guy a question or we give him a, a request, he looks to you to see what he should do. And I, at first I thought, wow, that, that's fascinating. Then I began to wonder, you know, was I too persuasive? Not because of threatening, it, it was emotional bonding, but that's, that's a positive thing, but also potentially negative. Any comments? There's like gentleman in the back. Hi, um, Phoenix McLaughlin. Um, do you see any way for the intelligence and law enforcement communities to somehow systematically integrate these scientific discoveries as they continue to happen into the methods they actually use? Does that seem possible or likely? I hope so. Yeah. <laughs> no, I, I'd, yeah. Say, yeah. I'd say it's very, it's very likely and it's happening. So uh, as I mentioned, we're, um, many of these studies are done, you know, of, of real interrogations that were conducted, coordinating with, with prior, uh, former inter current interrogators in the laboratory, but ultimately we come back to the training facilities and we kind of vet what we've learned in that, that context experimentally. Um, we built these wonderful relationships with the, with the training academies that uh, they've begun to see the, the benefits of the methods that are being developed. Again, by no means are we um, yet to revolutionize how they train. But we're beginning to see um, a process of kind of chipping away at some of the core assumptions that aren't supported by the science and, and some changes in um, tactical approaches or even kind of uh, global strategic approaches that are taught to interrogators. Um, and we've had the opportunity with the HIG, as was kind of mentioned, to begin to, to do this kind of research to practice effort. Let me just describe that very briefly so that you have a sense of that. Um, the HIG uh, brings together uh, academics who have done the research with professionals who can have conducted interrogations. And it conducts these research to practice training sessions that can last anywhere from two days to a week. Uh, in which interrogators from um, not only the HIG but other agencies are brought in and given the opportunity to kind of learn the science and given the opportunity to actually practice um, in 
uh, in role plays and in scenarios, uh, the use of those with feedback and coaching. Um, and we've seen uh, this start to uh, change the approach systematically that interrogators are using. Um, it's, uh, it's been open, the HIG has opened this to uh, other agencies uh, in the government and even some state, state local uh, law enforcement. Um, and we're at the point now where we're kind of doing a, a field validation, if you will, of a one-week training this year uh, in which we put together uh, essentially into um, what's the beginnings of, you might say, a new model uh, of interrogation and interviewing. Interviewing and interrogation, there is a distinction. Um, and we're beginning to not only train that, but um, as a scientist, it's really important not to just kind of take the findings that you've, um, that you've found in the lab and maybe in the training academies and kind of throw them out there in the training environment and then hope that they work. We're actually following them out into the field uh, and we're actually uh, measuring whether interrogators are picking up these uh, techniques, actually deploying them uh, compared to what they've done previously. And um, again, through the process here, we've, we've developed some measures of effectiveness and ability to code uh, interrogations that are conducted. And so this, this kind of uh, cyclical process, if you will, of um, going from the lab and, and the booth learning uh, ultimately to kind of vetting and developing these techniques, training them, but continuing to measure their effectiveness. Um, hopefully we'll begin to cycle back too because we're going to learn things as we deploy this. Um, we're going to find some ideas that need more vetting. Hopefully it comes back into controlled experimental environments and we continue that cycle. And I think that's why I say we're only, you know, four and a half years in. Um, uh, hopefully, there's there's more to this. Peter, let me, let me just okay, add one second here. Yeah, well, we've actually been on a campaign uh, to try to get the word out that this research is available to the community. Uh, the, the the last two years, Chris and I spoke at the International Association of Chiefs of Police conference, telling folks that this research is free. It's available. It's government sponsored. It's out there for you to use and to apply. Uh, last year, we spoke at the ILEDA conference, International Law Enforcement Educators and Trainers Association. We'll go back there again in April. So we are trying to get the word out to the uh, law enforcement national security community uh, that this government-sponsored research is available to you for free. So you can now start to upgrade and update your training programs with it. And, and uh, again, I know we've mentioned I'm, I'm very, very happy at the stance of the Air Force OSI has taken, we have some representative here t today. Uh, to me, they're at the forefront uh, of really trying to operationalize this in, in their day-to-day -day investigations. And I, I'm, I'm very proud to see what they are doing as a former trainer uh, to see how they're kind of incorporating this to actually improve uh, their operations. I'm just gonna call on Zulfikar, who's uh, visiting us from Pakistan. He's a senior Pakistani police official who actually ran, uh, he's one of the top police officials in Pakistan and he's applying uh, methods like Comstat to Lahore, which is a city of 10 million people. I just wanted to get your thoughts because I know you've interrogated a lot of senior counterterrorism, kind of senior terrorists in Pakistan. Yeah. You know, uh, I would build on the question that you had actually asked. You know, the biggest, uh, you know, the, uh, I can empathize with the approach that you are, you know, kind of telling us about, you know, the cognitive and empathetic, but, you know, the biggest enemy there actually is fear. Because when you have, for example, one person who is a suspect and you've had a big incident where that has already happened and uh, you don't know what's going to happen in a few days and there's a lot of stress, there's a lot of pressure, all of that is building up. And then you have this national environment of, you know, a, a lot of tension. So it's really very difficult to, uh, you know, uh, take this approach and uh, you know tell your superiors or even the you know the political people that you know uh, we are going to talk to them and it's going to take time because then as a senior police commander as a senior you know law enforcement official there's a lot of pressure on you as well so i was just thinking whether uh, when you have one or two suspects uh, even then this approach would work because uh, in many cases uh, what we have seen is that as, you know, probably uh, CIA resorted to that, you know, even to torture or those kinds of things, because under that kind of environment, it really becomes difficult to actually, you know, uh, take this approach as you're advocating. So, so the political, pro if there's a great deal of fear in the political environment, as there is in Pakistan right and, now. And, and pressure also. And then there's a lot of stress and you want to get as much information from one or two suspects. You don't know what kind of, uh, you know, things to expect in, you know, a couple of days. So under that kind of circumstance, it's really difficult. I think it's probably much more of your communication strategy, getting other people to know that it's an effective strategy. Because right now, you know, 
a lot of uh, people in the law enforcement community don't really understand that this approach is effective. You know, their gut feeling is that, you know, uh, it might be right when you are talking to an academic kind of in an academic environment, but, you know, uh, you, their gut feeling is that, you know, you have to resort to some kind of uh, coercion or some kinds of, you know, arm twisting to get information. I mean, that's what the, you know, the, the kind of the broad kind of consensus, you know, inside our gut is. So I just wanted you to address that. Yeah, no, we, we, we see that a lot. And, you know, in the law enforcement community, um, you know, we, my community has pretty readily accepted the physical sciences. I mean, our firearms instructors can tell you how many feet per second a bullet travels and what the cavity expansion is for a jacketed hollow point. And we know the physical sciences. <laughs> well, the physical science of DNA is telling us that we actually have a lot of people we've incarcerated for crimes they didn't commit. Mm. And what we're also finding out is some of those same people have falsely confessed to crimes they didn't commit. And, and, and so uh, I was talking to a, to a colleague not too long ago and he basically said something that I used to say, and I don't say anymore. Uh, an innocent person wouldn't commit to a, wouldn't confess to a crime they didn't commit. You know what they do, and and, and so 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 we need to get that out of our lexicon. And, and you can read the torture report. You can see tons of people who confessed due to some reasons, uh, uh, but but we have uh, innocent people in our jails uh, who confess to crimes they didn't commit. So so we have to kind of change that culture. And the other piece, when you're getting a confession, you don't know what you didn't get. If you stop at the confession, you don't know what you've left on the table. So, so you don't know what's within the realm of the possible, what you might have is extracted if you use some more advanced techniques with an individual. Mm -hmm. Matt? No. Um, it, it goes to also the gentleman in the question about uh, hope for the future, but also the senior police officer's observations about his experience and so forth. You know, here we are at New America, so um, let's propose a, a, a doctrine for American interrogation going forward. And I think there's three criteria that are absolutely essential. All three have to be uh, met before any strategy, any tactic would be adopted. Number one, it has to be evidence or science-based. We have to understand, again, that with high probability that certain actions will consistently produce certain results. You know, not just and you can't go by the fact that one of us sit up here and say, oh, I've been doing this for 30 years, listen to me. I've been, I may have been doing it wrong for 30 years, unless we have science to have those, the, establish those metrics. Secondly, it needs to be operationally vetted, because some things are simply not practical in the real world. And we have, need to make sure that we bring the real world into the laboratory, so to speak, so that, so that my, my science brethren can examine under the best possible circumstances. So you have the first one, again, being science-based, operationally vetted, and the third one I think is just as important because nothing takes place in a vacuum, and that it needs to be human rights compliant. Not hewing close to it or <laughs> respectful of it, but compliant within the most stringent standards, certainly common Article 3 of the Geneva Conventions. Why do I say that? Number one, the science says we don't have to be torturers to get information. Number two, morality tells us that that's the right thing to do. But think about its strategic consequences. How important, how vital would the information that you obtain through torture have to be to offset the fact that in some cultures that are storytelling cultures are going to talk about this Senate torture report for generations and generations and generations to, become, to come. So whatever small battle we might have won with information obtained through torture, there's wars that we've already lost. Well, I think uh, you know, we do hundreds of events, and this was really great. So thank you. It was really, really wonderful. Thank you.